to all those above me that watch over me, to all of you, my fave para peeps on this side of the veil, welcome. This is Reverend Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry. I'm your host, Reverend Sean the Rev. Welcome to my haunted house, my very haunted house. It's been quiet today, and that's a good thing. My guest today could very possibly make it active. She is a fairy ambassador, you know, and I do have elementals here on my property, so we'll see how that goes, and I will get to her as quickly as I can. Um, let's get to the prayer urn. Oh, it's full today. Okay. Peggy B from Wyoming, and I know Peggy, and I suspected I was going to pull this. This is going to be a first on the show. Peggy wants me to baptize your life on air. So, um, <laughs> Peggy, um, I know you know the answers. I'll, I, I, so I'm just going to give you a second or two between the questions to answer them. And uh, let me get my book here. This is the first, guys. The live baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peggy, do you reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Peggy, may the fire of the Holy Spirit descend upon us and take this sister of God back, this child of God back. As St. John the Baptist baptized our Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority given me by God, I baptize you, Peggy, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the Holy Family. I love you, Peggy. Have a great weekend, and happy St. Patrick's Day next week. Go out and have fun. Okay. Let's do the Paranormal Ministry mailbag. Boom. There we go. Josh T. from Arizona. Rev, is it end of times? I get asked this question all the time, and I never get tired of answering it. So, no, I do not believe we are in the end of times. Having said that, the evil one, yeah, I'm talking about you. The evil one has plunged much of mankind into darkness right now. Many are roaming around uh, in a state of spiritual confusion. Many have completely lost their spirituality. What comes after that? They've lost their humanity. Man is doing a lot of ugly things to their fellow man right now. I do believe that if we're not careful, we could set events into motion that could possibly cause something like end times. But I don't believe we're at end times right now. I believe God has something more in store for us. Having said that, it all starts right here. Who you see in the mirror. I tell people just every day you wake up, say a prayer, and just decide that that day you're going to be the best version of yourself that you can be that day. Start loving your fellow man. Start praying. Just start being a good person. Stop the violence. Stop the anger. Whoever it is you pray to, pray to that God. Whatever name you've attached to it or not. Whatever higher vibrational power of love and light above us that you pray to or believe in, 
pray to that entity to come down here and wrap his arms around us and protect us and help us out right now because we need it. All right. Anything you want to know about my wife and I and our ministry work, go to our website, www.ghost-b-gone.biz. I am also a spiritual advisor, intuitive coach, in addition to being an ordained exorcist. So there's a place on the website you can make an appointment to speak with me if you're having some spiritual issues not paranormal related. Head over to the page called the WSC course slash book. On that page, you'll find the ghost store. Cool things to purchase in there if you go for that sort of stuff. Scroll a little further down, you'll run into my new haunted autobiography, God, Ghost, and the Paranormal Ministry. And I quote, scariest book I ever published. That was Annette Munich, owner of Stellium Books, my publisher. But don't let that scare you off of purchasing a copy. It's a very different kind of feel-good story where good versus evil and a lot of times good wins in it. But the best part about the book is if you haven't done your good deed for the day yet, part of the proceeds of every purchase of every copy of my book goes to support stjude.org and St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Nevada, and the ASPCA. That's a beautiful thing. Get it a little less expensive at Amazon. If you get it off of the website, it comes autographed and closed in a house blessing kit. Scroll a little further down, you'll see the Worldwide Society of Exorcists, which I am a founding member. I offer a college-level online course through the WSE, Introduction to Spiritual Warfare. This is the course for you true warriors for Christ out there that feel a calling and a longing to want to know, have more knowledge to knowing how to draw your line in the sand, make a stand, circle the wagons, and put up a good fight against, God forbid, true evil if it ever comes calling. That's the course for you. All of my students that graduate get a stunning diploma, certificate of completion, suited for framing, along with some other very special blessed items that you can only get from yours truly, the Rev. You can enroll there at the, on the website, or if you want to know a little more about the course before making that type of commitment, there is a Worldwide Society of Exorcists Facebook page. You can read about it, or just call me. Uh, I'm approachable. I'm easy to find. Call me and talk to me about the course if you'd like to. Most importantly, please keep all of my former, current, and future students in your prayers. Thank you very much. God bless you all for tuning in. I don't have a show without you. Next Thursday is St. Patrick's Day 2022. Anybody you see wearing one of these Kiss Me I'm Irish, give them a big kiss. If you see somebody not caring, wearing green, give them a good pinch. All right, guys. Now comes the time that you all tuned in for. I love her. I respect her. She's so talented. Um, there's nobody like her. And I'm so happy that she took an hour out of her busy Friday schedule to be with us. She's a fairy ambassador. A critically acclaimed, well-known author. She's going to join us, and it's going to be St. Patrick's Day early here. She's going to talk about Irish paganism, Irish folklore, fairy lore, you name it, and anything else she wants to talk about. Brothers and sisters, please welcome to the show the one and only Morgan Daimler. Morgan, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me on again. It's always a, a good time when we get to chat. You look so pretty today. <laughs> Um, Thank you. And you look happy. And I told you that in the green room. Um, you know what? I wasn't going to ask you this. And, and forgive me for dragging you into this. Oh, good. <laughs> but I'm just, the spirit's moving me to ask you this. What about, I get people asking me all the times, Rev, are we end up times? People are so many, I mean, we just came out of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. People are paying through the nose for gas everybody's being mean to each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't even want to go there with the Ukraine thing. How in, in 2022 we can still have somebody in the world like a Putin that would want to do something like this to their fellow man. It's like if Texas wanted to invade Nevada, where I live. It's like me sitting in fatigues in my living room with a high-powered rifle, waiting for somebody to walk down the street wearing a cowboy hat, singing, all my exes live in Texas, I'm going to waste them. Um, 
I don't mean to I, laugh because I know it's very serious. That's yeah. just, uh, uh, the mental image of that was. A little... <laughs> yeah, and that's what it would be like. You know, yeah. uh, guardsmen from the National Guards here at Nellis Air Force Base knocking on the door, handing my wife an AK-47. Yeah. You know, oh my gosh, I'm in prayer constantly for us to come out of this. And I know who's behind it. And I know we're going to come out of this. But is there any, any, there's so many people out there that know you and love you. You got a huge following for your followers, for your friends. And I know you're a witch. Um, and you know, I love you. And, and we're going to talk about one of my other favorite witches, who's a f- friend of yours here in the show. Um, in your world, anything you want to add to that topic or or talk about when it comes to that what we're all going through and in in your world how is this being handled yeah i mean i think that you know when we when we stop and look at at history which of course is a big interest of mine as you know it's sad to say but things like this happen you know humans seem to not learn their lessons when it comes to this sort of destructive behavior. Um, And the idea, you know, is this the end of the world is a question people ask all the time when we're going through really difficult things. Um, You know, at the turn of the first millennia, they thought the world was ending the black plague. I mean, there's been a lot of horrible things that have happened across history that have made people feel like, you know, this must be the end. I obviously, I don't think this is the end. I think this is, you know, just a a part of what it's like to be human. Um, And, you know, times like this, for me, it's really a reminder of why it's important to be kind to other people and to to be considerate of what other people are going through. Um, You know, yeah, it's scary. We're all scared about what's going to happen or not happen or, you know, what's going on with with everything in the world right now. Um, But it's really, you know, when we... When we live through times like this, I I think it's important for us just to remember that humans are communal. You know, we we need other people. We need other people to survive. And I think that we can find a lot of beauty even in the terrible times looking at people helping each other. I think it was Mr. Rogers who said, you know, in in times of great whatever uh, uh, tragedy, you know, look for the helpers. And I think it's so easy to get sucked into just looking at the tragedies, just looking at the terrible things and forget to look for the helpers and for the good things that are happening in the middle of all of this. Um, so that's that's the biggest thing that I kind of look for myself in these situations and also try to encourage other people, you know, be a helper and look for the helpers and just remember that, you know, we'll get through this if we stick together. Well said, well said. And and what else can be said? You know, um, uh, yeah, I talked to one of my indigenous friends the other day and I just very just kind of a matter of factly, I didn't expect the response. I just said, how's the great father doing? And we get into many of my indigenous friends. We talk all the time. Do we pray to the same God? You know, and it, we kind of yeah. joke back and forth about that. And and so serious look on his face. And he didn't say another word. And indigenous people, hopefully I don't get hate mail for this. They're, they're a very few words, you know. They're not big conversationalists. So for him to have this look on his face and just say to me, uh, he's crying. Um, and just the way he said it to me just was, uh, I, I didn't say another word. I was just like, yeah, uh, I can feel it. So, yeah, I'm just in constant prayer. And um, and it, what you said was so beautiful. So let's just hope that, um, yeah, let me get off of depressing stuff. It's St. Patrick's Day next Thursday. Mm-hmm. Again, another St. Patrick's Day will come and go. And I probably won't go out and celebrate it like I did back <laughs> in the day when I was a raging alcoholic. Well, but um, my wife and I decided next year we're going to try and at least get to the parade, mm-hmm. get to the Celtic gathering, and maybe the one one month after every year, one month after St. Patrick's Day here, we have the Highland Games. That's like a big, huge Celtic gathering. So we'll try to make that. Um, do you like those? Do you, uh, with your background, do you go to, first of all, um, 
I know people, clergy that are friends of mine are going to say, you know, you have a lot of friends that are witches. <laughs> okay. I, I, ha- I, I have I, a lot I, of friends that are Christian. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I, anybody, even there's, even in the clergy, there's darkness and there's people who have perverted, you know, what we stand for and have done some terrible things. And we find that in all religions. Um, I know there's pagans and witches that pervert that belief system and and do things they shouldn't be doing with it. You're not one of them. I saw you were going to be on Solaris's show. What was it? Just recently. I wanted to watch that show, listen to that show so bad. I, it was a Friday night. I one of those weird nights where I unexpectedly I work when I do work it's in the evenings. Mm-hmm. I cl- help close down this animal hospital, mm-hmm. and I work and I I sterilize all their surgical packs so they're ready for the doctors the next day after they close. So I got called into work that night, and I didn't listen to the show because she's one of my favorite, not only favorite oh. people on the planet but one of my favorite witches on the planet. And I knew that that was going to be a rocking show and I missed it. Um, so um, what is, I don't know what St. Patrick's day is like for you, or do you go to many Celtic gatherings or fairy <laughs> gatherings or what you do? How do you, how do you, how do you enjoy what happens to you? What do you do in your, introduce sure. me to your world. Sure. Um, well, you know, apart from the whole witchcraft aspect of things, um, I am part of the Irish American diaspora, which basically is the Irish community in America, um, people who emigrated. So, you know, first generation and second generation and, you know, in my case, third generation. And so there's a strong sort of sense of trying to preserve the culture. And I mean, I could get into a whole philosophical discussion about that because it's definitely Irish America is not the same as Ireland Irish but you know it's it's the desire to sort of remember your roots and have that feeling of connection and St. Patrick's Day has kind of become like the the Irish American national holiday <laughs> it's it's like kind of a requirement if you're Irish American I think to celebrate St. Patrick's Day you know one way or another obviously if you're Catholic, which a lot of Irish Americans are, then you would go to mass and and do all of that. Um, but even for people who aren't, you know, there's, you know, getting together with family and uh, usually some sort of traditional food. Uh, as we were chatting about right before we started with my family, it is corned beef and cabbage, which is contrary to the rumors, not Irish. <laughs> it's a very Irish American thing. Um, but it's my family's literally always done it. You know, I can remember you know, my grandmother cooking it and then my parents and, you know, now I do it. It's, it's just been passed down. So it's, it's a tradition. We still do it. Um, And we try to find, you know, something cultural, whether it's Irish dancers or singers or the parade, uh, which we were also talking about before the show started, Uh, you know, something that just sort of helps that connection um, and in my family, we also tend to talk a lot about uh, our family, you know, and that that journey from Ireland to here, uh, which in my case was my grandfather came over um, in the 1940s. So, I mean, it's at this point, I realize that is 80 years ago, but, you know, for us, it seems fairly recent. <laughs> and, you know, so we talk about different family members and, and just... Uh, things that nurture that connection. So I think it's less of a religious holiday for us, but it's still very spiritual in a different way, if that makes sense. Totally, totally does. And I still, and you're right, I still make sure that day, even if if I just go to work for a couple of hours that night or, or not, or stay home and I'm, you know, doing whatever it is I do here, just natural to make sure I have some green on and to, well, St. Patrick's, uh, yeah. I was baptized under him as my, you know, patron saint. And many years later in the Catholic religion also confirmed under him. Uh, so it's always been a huge day. So I'll do something. And my wife will probably uh, come home and make traditional American Irish fare. You know, she, that's her care, her heritage too, is all mm-hmm. that. So whatever it is you do, um, 
you're on you've always been on the prayer list since the first day we met i will pray that you have a wonderful saint patrick's day you and your family and how did you go from the way you were raised um to become uh this beautiful witch fairy ambassador know about all of the fairy lore and mm -hmm. and irish paganism and I mean, you're, I always refer to you as an authority on those topics, and you are. You've written so many wonderful books. So talk to me about growing up and becoming that. Sure. So I have to start <laughs> before I was born with my parents because my, my father was Irish Catholic, um, Irish American Catholic, but my mother was Protestant. And this was in the 1970s. I'm making myself sound horribly old when I say this, but this is in the 1970s when that was like not a thing <laughs> like oh yeah wow i just that just hit yeah. me like a bolt of lightning yeah yeah and you know particularly as i mentioned like my my grandfather was irish and in ireland there's a lot of history with that that was still active in the 70s um and it was a really difficult issue so there's a reason I'm saying all this, I promise. <laughs> um, when my parents uh, met and got together and wanted to get married, it actually was caused quite a bit of contention with their families. Wow. Um, the families were against it. <laughs> and they eventually, the compromise they reached in order for everyone to agree to this marriage was that any children would not be raised with any religion because my mother's side of the family did not want catholic grandchildren and my dad's side of the family did not want protestant grandchildren wow. so their wacky compromise which to this day i still do not understand was that my sister and i would not be raised in anything basically so what that meant practically for me was growing up we had a lot of cultural traditions you know we had saint patrick's day with corned beef and cabbage and culture and all that but we really were not allowed to do religious stuff for the most part. Like if I, when I was a little older, wanted to go with my friends, if they were going to church, I was allowed to, but in my house, there wasn't any religious instruction. And I was always the sort of person who had experiences with things. Um, I, I saw spirits, I saw fairies um, and I think if I had been raised differently, things would have gone in a very different direction. <laughs> but because I really didn't have any sort of context uh, for that, except for the cultural one, and of course fairies are a big thing in Irish culture, um, ghosts are actually as well. And they're not really treated in a negative way, particularly in Irish America. Um, in Ireland, they're a little more like you want to be very careful and ward them out. But in, in the Irish American diaspora, it's a little more like this is another part of our heritage that we accept. So when I would tell my parents, oh, I see fairies and, you know, I want to leave a note on the windowsill to the fairies, which I did when I was like eight years old, I think. Instead of being like, no, that's a terribly bad idea or no, those aren't real. They were just like, oh, OK, you know that's what you want to do um so you know when i got a little bit older and a friend of mine uh had actually gotten a, a book relating to to modern neo-pagan witchcraft um and showed it to me me with my like vacuum of a religious background i was like oh this makes so much sense because this is spirits and you know, this idea of balance in the world. And it just, it all made sense and clicked for me. So I sort of moved forward with that and went in that direction. And um, obviously incorporated the fairies and started studying the folklore and ended up where I am today. So it's a very weird backstory, but. Oh no, it's a wonderful story. <laughs> uh, one of our um, viewers at wanted to know where you were from. I'm from Maine originally. Wow. Yes. That you know the the thing of that story that's hitting me like another bolt of lightning. <clears throat> excuse me, is love won't be denied. Your parents were that much in love that they, that it didn't matter. All of that. Yeah. I mean, that was a rough time. But Protestant Catholics, the seventies. Yeah. Oh, and you. I mean, when I say my my dad's family was was Irish Catholic, I mean like my dad was in seminary, 
for a little while. And then he actually left to join the Navy uh, during Vietnam because he felt very strongly about that. But like he he was literally in seminary to be a priest. That was how serious this was with his family. Like this it is a very religious family. So, yeah, you can imagine how it went over. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, something you said to me I'd never heard before. The letter on the windowsill to the fairies. Oh. Talk to me about that. I had never heard that before. That was a an eight-year-old me thing. Um, I, I did a lot of things when I was little, which I think were just purely intuitive. Um, some of them I then found out other people did as well. Like I used to build fairy houses. Um, I would just, you know, go out and other kids are building whatever they're building mud pies or you know what have you and i'm out there at like six years old and i'm getting little rocks and sticks and making little houses for the fairies which i then found out later actually it's like a widespread thing that people do now they're much fancier um so you know for me Al alberta from ireland wants to say hi to you maybe you know her <laughs> wow we got somebody um, from ireland very cool very cool. Yeah, because it's like 1030 over there. So thank you for joining us. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. God bless you. Um, Kate, I know what I want to ask you. You mentioned ghosts. Mm -hmm. I will get back to Ireland one day. Uh, my guest next week is coming on the day after St. Patrick's Day, May Hernan. She's a born in, you know what? I, I I I don't remember if she's now living here. She was back here for a while, or if she's back in Ireland, born and raised in Ireland. Uh, she's an entertainer, but um, uh, she says that if you have ancestry from Ireland, you will you will return one day. I'm hoping that that fable comes true for me because I, I want to get back there. Um, yeah, you mentioned the... ghosts. Do ghosts and fairies do they? I mean, I believe I have. Is, would, would a fairy come under the umbrella of elementals? This is such a convoluted topic, um, honestly. There are a lot of people today that refer to fairies as elementals or that include elementals as fairies. I think it's it gets a little blurry depending on how we're defining certain things. Um, but, you know, fairy itself is the way it's used is kind of a general term that encompasses a lot of different specific kinds of things. Um, so like in Ireland, uh, in, obviously in English, they, in Irish, they would have totally different words. But in English, they'll use the word fairy. But you're talking about things like the puka, um, the banshee, uh, leprechauns, which everyone is familiar with um the uh i'm trying to think there's so many of them uh Ishiski, the water horse um you know there's all these different specific types of beings and then you have things like if we're talking about the the Aishi or the thinashi the the people of the fairy mounds where sometimes people will see humans among their numbers and it's a question of whether this is this a person who is deceased and is now among the fairies is this a person who was taken while they were alive and is now among the fairies you know it's, it becomes a, a bit of a gray zone so when we're talking about ghosts and fairies sometimes it's a little difficult to be completely clear on where that line is um, like the banshee which i just mentioned it literally means fairy woman um, banshee but uh, when you look at different stories for them, you know, some of the Banshee, um, some of the Minashi would be the plural, some of the Banshees would um, have been goddesses previously. Um, so like Kleana, Anya, um, for example. Um, I should say Kleana and Avil. I don't think Anya is actually a Banshee. So let me correct myself there. Okay. Um, and then others are just uh, sort of general fairy women that, you know, are just mentioned as being women, you know, from the fairy hills, from the fairy mounds. But then you also have some banshee who are supposed to have been humans. And then um, when they died, either they died tragically and then they kind of linger to, to mourn their li still living family. Um, in some cases, they were professional keening women. And keening women, it, it was a career that a, a person could have, a woman could have in Ireland up to... I think the 
the end, end of the 19th century into the early 20th century. I, there aren't any more at this point um, where you would basically hire them to go to a funeral and cry and weep and mourn. Um, keening is hard to explain in, in English. It's, it's crying and, and wailing, but it's also like singing at the oh, same yeah. time. Okay. Um, there's recordings of it. It's, it's very moving and very eerie to listen to. But these would be people who would be paid professionally to do that. And the idea was that some banshee became that because they had been these professional keening women in life and they hadn't been, been good. Like they had neglected their duty. They hadn't put the effort into it, I guess you would say. So when they died, the punishment then was that they had to continue doing that. Wow after death so do you see what i'm saying like the line yeah. there between a human ghost and a, a fairy get very fuzzy i you know you and i've had this discussion before about me um uh and our friend from ireland agrees um i i've told you the story that i believe i have elementals here on the property that prevented a huge tree from falling on my house and I went out there because I spoke to them and asked them and I gave them an offering. And of course I had people in, in colleagues of mine, you know, get mad at me for doing that. Um, but it, you know, for whatever reason, the tree didn't fall on my house. Now I, I talked to a lot of paranormal investigators that have gone to investigate haunted locations and the things they've experienced were so unlike a traditional haunting or even unusual things that I've, I've experienced over years at hauntings. So I'm wondering if many of these hauntings or alleged hauntings are actually elemental or fairy hauntings. Mm -hmm. And these people aren't, are, aren't recognizing the signs. Could you, what would you think some of the telltale signs would be if you're investigating and you're actually, these people have been experiencing elemental or fairy activity versus a typical um, non-human entity. Well, usually that is way different, but even disembodied spirits, what would be some of the things, like if you were called in, you know, I'm having some issues, uh, Morgan, I know it's not what you do, but would you come over to my house and see what you see, feel what you feel, tell me what I'm dealing with here? How, how would you be able to tell? Sure. Um, and I mean, me personally, I, I have like three categories that I put things in. You know, there's the disembodied humans, ghosts, um, there's fairies, and then there's everything else, <laughs> I guess you would say. Okay. Um, so you would get like a, what people would normally label like demonic spirits or um, certain other types of negative beings that aren't human ghosts or fairies, but they kind of get their own category. <laughs> of things gotcha. um so usually if uh someone is coming in for advice and they almost always think it's a haunting because yeah. everyone just defaults and assumes that it's ghosts and they'll be describing what's going on and with hauntings i usually look for things like um feeling like you're being watched um drop in temperature is often a thing with hauntings objects being moved um like not from one room to another but like slid across a table or knocked off a table uh, electronics being messed with so electronics turning on or off when they shouldn't um things like that uh dogs if people have dogs uh they tend to be um very aware if there's ghosts around in my experience Cats, on the other hand, are cats, so they could care less generally about pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone who has cats will totally understand what I just said. Um, when it comes to fairies, um, you know, there's certain things with fairies because they operate on different roles than ghosts do. Um, you know, a ghost is a disembodied human. They have to really pull a lot of energy to influence this world fairies don't have that uh to worry about they can interact if they choose to or not if they choose to so they tend to be much more physical um not that ghosts can't be physical but it tends to be uh, less common and it's usually one thing um, and then it kind of pulls back because it takes them a lot of energy 
when you're talking about fairies, you know, objects actually disappearing, like you put your car keys down on the counter and then you come back and they're just gone. Like they're, they're not anywhere around. You can't find them. Usually they reappear eventually, but that sort of thing where the object is physically removed in some Let me sense. throw, I hate to interrupt you. Let me throw sure. this at you. I had a client. Anytime she brought silverware out because she was getting ready to eat, spoon, fork, knife, sat it down. If she went to go get the meal or get something out of the fridge or go to the restroom real quick before actually sitting down at her meal, many times the silverware would be gone. Yeah. She would find it. She'd go take a walk with the dog and find the silverware outside alongside the road. Yeah. I don't know if it was set there for her to end up seeing it, but many of these things would be bent um, yeah. when she found them. Is that classic something else was going on other than a ghost? Yeah, that to me, I would be really suspicious that that was, um, I mean, obviously the, the line between fairies and other negative entities that are miscellaneous negative entity category can sometimes be a little blurry. Um, like in, in my personal experience, uh, and ghosts are not my my main forte, whereas fairies are. But in my personal experience, I've never seen ghosts actually physically mark someone up, um, like scratches. Anytime someone's talking about getting scratched, especially if blood's drawn, to me, that's always a big red flag that whatever you're dealing with is probably not a ghost. It's and some, fairies something can else. do those things is, mm -hmm. is what I'm taking from this conversation. Yes. Yeah. Can I fairies actually... aren't like Tinkerbell. They can be big like you and me, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. They can, they can range in size. They can range in appearance. Um, I actually had talked to a woman, this was at this point, probably 12 or 13 years ago, who was renovating a house. And it's very common if a house is empty for several years to end up with fairies come kind of coming in. Um, they're just fond of abandoned human places and they don't know the difference obviously between this is for sale and just no one's buying it for three years and this is abandoned. Yeah. And um, she'd bought a house that had been empty for years and came in and started doing a lot of renovations and uh, was having other things going on. Like there was stuff was getting moved, stuff was missing um, people were feeling very unsafe just the the energy of the place you would walk in and you would feel threatened um and she ended up being physically pushed off of a retaining wall um and broken arm if i remember correctly oh. um but that's fairies that was definitely them being like they she was doing a lot of work putting up a lot of iron which they don't like and you know kind of coming into their space as far as they were concerned and making all these changes and they, they can be very, very physical in that way. Um, and I, I've seen ghosts do things like appear suddenly in front of people so that the person, you know, falls or trips, but physically shoving someone hard enough to push them off of something um, as opposed to just scaring them or tripping them or, you know, causing the, in another way. Um, to me, that's, that's usually, something else and usually fairies let me ask you this question real quick what what i know that you have i've heard you talk about the do's and don'ts and not make if you do this it will make them mad now i thought when i went out there the feeding part and then i hear you talking about making a little fairy house how do you know what's going to make them mad if i go out there and i give them an offering which i did that time mm -hmm. to don't let this tree fall on my house um and i will go into the cats here in a second but you know, I wondered after hearing you talk once about that, like, okay, fine. Now, do I have to keep going out there and giving them offerings? They could, they could eat eat my dog food, my cat food, because those are out there if they want. Yeah. And I don't have an issue with that. But talk to us a little bit about. Let me. See how much time we got? We got plenty of time. Twenty minutes. Talk to us about do's, big do's, and big don'ts with the fairies. Some of it's always going to depend a little bit on exactly what you're dealing with. Um, because it's, it's kind of like with human cultures, like something that's considered polite in England might be considered rude in the U S or, you know, pick a country and the same thing applies. So certain types of fairies might have slightly different expectations. Um, when I was in Iceland, 
the beings that they have in Iceland, they call them Hulda folk or Alfar, but they're very similar to what we would call fairies in English. Um, they are a little more lenient and a little more forgiving, <laughs> I think, than what we find in like Ireland and Scotland. And, you know, I have a friend who is Welsh and I've talked with her quite a bit about uh, Welsh fairies compared to Irish fairies. And it seems like the Welsh fairies are also a little more lenient with some things. So my point is just like there, there is some variation, um, but generally speaking, uh, the majority of them really don't like being insulted. <laughs> That's kind of an across the board thing. And you always have to sort of assume because they can often be invisible to humans that they can be around and you're not seeing them. You don't know they're there. So it's sort of a standing rule that you don't say things that are rude or insulting about the good folk, about fairies, um, because they might hear you. And if they do hear you, they're probably going to react badly. Um, the thing with the offerings is really, you know, just don't make it a regular routine unless you're going to keep it as a regular routine forever. Because as far as they're concerned, you know, if, if, the way I usually explain this is it's all very sort of like formal and legal when it comes to fairies. If you can kind of get into the mindset of like you need a fairy lawyer to deal with okay, a lot yeah. of these things. Um, as far as they're concerned, if you're doing it on a regular basis, then you are agreeing to do it on that schedule forever. Um, which is why we see in a lot of the folklore the idea of always leaving something out at when you do a particular activity or at a certain time because then it's expected that you're going to do that um there's actually a story i believe this is in a book called the fairy faith in celtic countries of a girl in ireland um, obviously this would have been you know a hundred years ago who um had been catholic and had been in the habit when she milked her cow of um putting a little milk on the ground for the fairies which is a very common thing and then she converted to Protestantism, which, of course, at you know, a particular time was much less accepting of fairy practices. So she stopped doing it. And she found that when she stopped doing it, she was plagued with accidents when it came to milking. The bucket would fall over. The cow would kick the bucket over. Like something would always happen and she would lose all the milk. So she finally started um, pouring out the little offerings again, even though you know, it really wasn't something that her her new Protestant brothers and sisters were very accepting of. But she felt like she had to or the fairies were just going to keep taking all of her milk every time. Yeah. Um, but that sort of that sort of illustrates what I'm talking about with they had come to expect it. And, you know, they didn't care why she stopped doing it. They just did not accept <laughs> that she stopped what? doing it. <laughs> What about the fairy home? You, you as a child built them. Do you still do that to this day? Um, I do. Uh, it's and what do, now? If you go out there and build a fairy home, now I'm thinking about that might be my weekend project after this conversation. It's the one thing I have not done on this property. Are you expected to go out there and keep it up? Like if if some weather event ruins it, or you know whatever, do you have to go out there and keep you know? making sure it's in good condition and all that? Um, I mean, you would you would definitely want to keep an eye on it. Um, and I see that Alberta is mentioning, yeah, never build over a fairy's wrath. Uh, wrath is a um, hill, a hill or a mound, especially say, with fairies. Is that, yeah, yeah, I heard that. Um, I'm, I'm glad she, I'm glad she, that was a great. Or, or disturb their yeah. property. Yeah. Um, yeah. You never want to, if something belongs to them. Even if it's them, a little fairy home, you don't want to put it on a fairy mound. No. Um, no. no. You just, their, their space is their space. Um, the fairy houses, which um, you'll find everywhere now. I'm actually surprised by how widespread they've become because obviously when I had started doing them, when I first heard about them, it was, a more obscure sort of a thing. Um, can and I go now to the store? Like, like a, can I go to a really high end arts and crafts store and buy one already made and just bring it home like garden decoration and, and put it in my yard? Oh yeah. Yeah. You can. Okay. And that's, that's um, okay. You don't have to build it from the, the natural elements around you with your own hands. You can do that. Yeah. You don't have to. Um, okay. You can obviously, do I have um, to keep? Can... Do I have to be the housekeeper? No, 
no, not okay. no. Um, there actually are several different uh, museums now that have fairy houses as exhibits. So they'll have like a, a trail where you can walk. Um, when I was in, um, I'm trying to remember if this was in Cork or Kerry in Ireland uh, a few years ago before the pandemic, um, I went to Doreen Gardens, which is an amazing, amazing place. And uh, they actually have fairy houses kind of scattered around when you're walking. And it's this sort of thing now, um, you know, I have friends who live in Dublin that talk about seeing them in Dublin, particularly in the parks. It's, it's just something that's becoming more widespread. Um, how it originally started, I honestly don't know. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that seems to have like taken on a life of its own. Are they worldwide or did they start in Ireland and then they decided to jump on the Titanic? Like, like, um, I, I, well, are we talking about fairies or fairy houses <laughs> before fairies. I Fairies. I mean, like, okay. they, they ha I wonder if this was a world worldwide phenomena thing, and this this was their world, yeah. or were they did they travel? I was gonna say because I think fairy houses started in the U.S. and exported everywhere. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I I think so. Although I, it would be sort of hard to prove for sure, but I, I suspect that was the case. Um, fairies themselves. I mean. Again, some of this gets into how we're going to be defining certain terms. I don't want to get too semantic on everyone. But if we look at, at the general definition of what a fairy is, um, they're pretty much a worldwide phenomena. Um, other cultures, obviously, non-English speaking cultures don't use the word fairy. But um, you'll find the word fairy used to translate whatever the, the native term would be in that culture. Um, so like in Korean, you find the Yojang and they, I'm sorry, I'm sure I mispronounced that because my Korean is terrible, but the Yojang and that usually gets translated as fairy. Um, in Brazil, I think they call them duende. And I, again, my Spanish is also terrible. So I apologize. I speak many, many languages badly and a <laughs> few reasonably well. Um, but that gets translated a lot as either elves or fairies um, and and so on. So you know, I'm not saying those directly are the same thing, but I'm saying it's close enough that that's the English word that's used to translate it, you know, when stories are getting translated into English, for example. So I think the concept of a being that belongs to another world, a world that we would call fairy, the other world, what have you, um, that is powerful, some of them were seen as gods sometimes um, other times they're just sort of mischievous there's like a whole range when we look at them um, they seem to really like dairy products a lot of them if it's a culture that has dairy they're going to like dairy products there's there's sort of this checklist of like what we would look for to consider it a fairy um, again using the english word and we can find something in any culture around the globe that's going to fit that checklist um, and again, it's they would have different names in the different cultures, so it gets a little um, confusing. And I, I wouldn't necessarily call them all fairies, but definitely fairy-like beings everywhere. Um, but on the same hand, we do also have a lot of stories and a lot of evidence that when people emigrated from Ireland, from Scotland, from Wales, that these beings um, traveled with them. So we find stories, you know, going back into okay. the, the 18th century in the U.S. of people talking about um, seeing fairies that they recognize from their their homeland. They become over, family. They, they attach sort of like family members. Yeah, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. I mean, we do have one story of a man who left Ireland specifically to get away from a fairy woman. <laughs> Didn't work. Um, it did not. He ended. We oh. know about this because he wrote back to his family and said it didn't work. You know, she followed me. She is here now too. And so, you know, sometimes well, I, I want to ask your thing, opinion but... on some. Before, please don't let the show end without me having you take the time to tell everybody that you want to know. A, everything about you, where they can get your books, what books you recommend they start if they're just now learning about you. Um, your advice on this neighborhood that I know of where they basically started a neighborhood 
paranormal watch because everybody in the neighborhood was experiencing things that aren't of a typical haunt type stuff. Mm -hmm. I believe it's elemental or possibly fairy or elf or leprechaun or whatever the case may be. Something in that range. The only, the only thing that they all have in common is right behind this neighborhood, a, hu a huge company moved in there and dug up the, the largest gravel pit I've ever mm -hmm. seen in my life. It looks like the Grand Canyon. And they must have well, that would definitely agitate. Out. Yeah, that would definitely agitate anything that was present. What can what can this neighborhood do? That's going to be tough. Um, yeah, you know, particularly spirits that are closely tied to the land like that. Um, they're not always really good at understanding the difference between like this human that did a destructive thing and this human who just happens to live here. You know, when they get upset about things they tend to you know sort of like if we as a human have like a, a woodpecker you know putting a hole in our house and then we see another woodpecker we're not going to distinguish really whether this is a different woodpecker or the same one because we don't have yeah. no way to know it just they all look the same yeah. as woodpeckers you know to humans kind of the same thing with these land spirits they don't always really understand that humans are, are individual people in my experience um and also yeah you know, so the folklore kind of indicates that too um the best thing really that they can do in my experience would be to have some people go out probably to the edge of that property line where the gravel pit starts and just talk to these spirits and be honest and say you know we don't like this either this is horrible and destructive and, and we're not happy that it's here. Um, you can try doing something like an offering. I would probably do like clean water in that case. Uh, just pour out some clean water and say, you know, this is for you. You know, Has their homes been destroyed and should, if they, if they go along with this, mm -hmm. uh, should everybody in the neighborhood put a couple of fairy homes on their property? After they go and they apologize for what happened, this was in us. We're we're sorry for what happened. We're mad about it too, and we're offering you these fairy homes to have a little place, a little roof over your head, rather than just be stuck in this huge gravel pit. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily hurt. the The point with the fairy homes, um, again, keeping in mind that you put this in your yard and not in your house, because that's a whole different. Like, you don't necessarily want to invite things into your home that are going to be potentially dangerous and destructive but gotcha. the idea of having these fairy houses outside is to just sort of acknowledge that you know these spirits are there and that you are not antagonistic to them that you are willing to be a good neighbor pun intended because that's often a euphemism for fairies that you're willing to be a good neighbor and you know that you want just want to live in peace and you're not gonna bother them you know if if they are willing to like not bother you so not an entirely bad idea of a thing to do. I mean, it's it, it's it's it, they you're absolutely right. If this is what we're dealing with, um, they get very physical. I mean, a, a person's tire will be flat when they come home from work, wake up the next morning to go to work in their driveway. They didn't go anywhere. There's a hole in the tire, but there's no screw or nail in there. Like traditionally, if you run over something like that, yeah. the evidence is still there. Things like that. Things like. You know, the, the thing that sticks out of your tire that you put the air in mm -hmm. has been gnawed off and that yeah. made the tire go flat. Um, just just not usual, not even not even poltergeistish or demonic. Some of the pranksterish type things that are happening to the people in this neighborhood. Yeah. And I, I know it's because of what the the gravel company did. I know it. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's a bit of a unique situation because you're dealing with something where a lot of stuff has been stirred up and agitated and is now unhappy and upset, but not because of these people. They just happen to be the ones receiving it. I would expect that the gravel place is also probably having a lot of weird accidents and problems going on. I bet um, you they are big time. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you're stuck in the situation where you're living with the consequences of this, you know, you've got to do what you can to kind of try to settle things back down. So, 
Well, listen, I'm going to throw it to you now to tell everybody about where they can follow you, find you, find your books, buy your books. What books would you recommend to to people that already know of your work and definitely people that are just now being introduced to your work? All of that stuff. Sure. So um, I do have a Patreon. I know that that got flashed across the screen at one point. Um, I do a lot of translation work from Old Irish uh, into English, the older mythology. Um, I do uh, new English translations of that, if that interests anybody. Um, I am an author with a company called Moon Books uh, out of London. Uh, I actually have a book coming out in uh, the end of July, I believe it is, called Pagan Portals A She, which is specifically about oh, Irish. Oh, yeah, I did write that down. Beliefs. That um, sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited about that one. Um, I think it's an important thing to kind of add to what's out there because there's really not a lot out there that is focused just on the Irish. Um, you have authors like Eddie Lenahan, um, Laura O'Brien. Uh, there's a, a couple others that are uh, more local, more regional. You have a site like IE where you can research things, but there's not a lot out there on the market for books that is really just specifically focused on Irish belief. Um, so I'm excited to get that one out there. And then I have a book called uh, Pagan Portals 21st Century Fairy, uh, which will be out next uh, February, I believe. So I know that's a little ways away. It might actually be January next year. Um, and that one is actually looking at fairies and fairy belief in the 21st century and talking about modern encounters and modern perceptions. So that might particularly be of interest to this audience. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. It's not out for a little bit, but uh, you know, mention that one. And all my stuff can be found on Amazon. I know a lot of people hate Amazon. So you can also find it in Barnes and Noble. Um, brick and mortar stores, if you ask, can often get them in. Uh, and I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Sadly, I'm everywhere. Uh, all under my name, Morgan Daimler. If you want my books and you um, haven't been able to have any luck anywhere else or you're uncomfortable with Amazon, because again, I know a lot of people don't like them, you can always message me on social media. And I, I do the whole signed book thing too. So that's an Very option. Cool. I think that's, I'm everywhere. So you I think are, that's everything. I, I, I know I've told you this and I, I don't keep wanting to about, you know, beat you over the head with it, but I do love you. I respect you. I think you're such, uh, so talented and, um, you, you know, you're on the prayer list. Um, I'm not done with you. I'm going to have you back as soon as the show's over with. I'm going to get messages. When is she coming back? So you haven't heard the last of me. You know that. But thank Always you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for spending an hour out of your busy, busy Friday to uh, spend with us. Have a happy St. Patrick's Day. God bless you. And I will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was a lot of fun. You're welcome, Morgan. I'll talk to you soon. Good night. Wow. I've got, I can't wait to relay her advice to this neighborhood. It's, I'm telling you guys, I kid you not, not traditional haunting. Something else is going on there, stirred up by this gravel company and um, just craziness and just great. And I didn't get a chance to talk to her about my cat issue. I'll do that next time. All right. I will be here next week with another brand new live show day after St. Patty's Day. My special guest, you all know her, you all love her, Mae Hernan, born and raised in Ireland, may still be in Ireland. I forgot if she's still out here or went back home. She's a wonderfully talented entertainer. I'll try to get her to sing some songs for us next week. Um, thank you to the uh, Adrian Hart, Zach Clayton, Things Network, the Paranormal United Network, Paralanx, and Paralanx 2 for simulcasting my show. Um, what else do I want to tell you guys other than I love each and every one of you too? I hope you have a, a wonderful St. Patrick's Day. And you know what? Things happen for a reason. A friend of mine sent me this just the other day, and I wasn't going to do this. But I saw it when I reached down to, to see who was next week's guest, and it goes with the question earlier today about being end of times or not. So I'm going to leave you all with this. Hang it on the cross. 
If you have a secret sorrow, a burden, or a loss, an aching need for healing, hang it on the cross. If worry steals your sleep and makes you turn and toss, if your heart is feeling heavy, hang it on the cross. Every obstacle to faith or doubt you come across, every prayer unanswered, hang it on the cross. For Christ has borne our brokenness and dearly paid the cost to turn our trials to triumph by hanging on the cross. Amen. I love you all. Good night, Danny. Good night, dog. Good night, Jack. Good night, Harold. Rest in peace. Good night, Ernie. Good night, Bill. Good night, Dan. God bless you all. You're all on the prayer list. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Peace. Good night, everyone.